just want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, today we'll be talking about sudden onset muscle weakness. Um, Jenny, I'm not sure how to get this off of the screen. Although I love looking at your picture, Jenny. <laughs> I'm not sure how to. I believe this. if you share screen, I will go away. Um, let's see what I can do on that. Is that better? Yes, that looks much better, I think. All right. So again, I just want to thank everybody for joining us here um, today and spending your evening with us. Again, I'm Leah and I'm the Chief Learning Officer here at Advanced eClinical Training. Um, if you are new to our webinar series, um, <clears throat> just want to uh, thank you for coming. Uh, we try to do one or a few every month um, and you will receive a um, certificate uh, to your email address um, the one that you used to sign up for this webinar uh, for joining us for a one hour of um, shadowing. Uh, if you are new to advanced clinical training, just a little bit of background. We are a fully online allied healthcare program. We offer um, training in medical assisting, patient care tech, pharmacy tech, um, uh, pharmacy tech, and then also uh, physical therapy as well. Um, we are all, uh, it is all asynchronous and online. So the beauty of that is that you complete your coursework when it's most convenient for you. So um, it makes it very convenient for people. Um, and I know that we'll be sharing a, um, a discount enrollment code to any one of our programs at the end um, in the chat, uh, I know that Jenny will put it there um, in case that you are new to the program and you want to sign up for one of them. So I am going to go ahead here and get started. I'm going to make this very interactive as well. There's a couple of polls that I'm going to share with you. So I want you all to answer. Um, and then we're going to have a question and answer session at the end as well. Um, so you'll be viewing a real patient that's in the emergency room and um excuse me they will be uh, of course that they were recorded with their permission um and then we're going to kind of go over their what was going on with them and um kind of what their symptoms are all the way around All right, so I will just go ahead and Leah, are you sharing your computer sound? Um, I thought I was. Let me just try again here. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. I think if you stop sharing and reshare and the next time you reshare your screen. Okay, we got a 15 years old female patient. Are we good? Uh, she came to yep. the clinic because of a uh, weakness on, on her upper and lower extremities. Can you please explain to me why you came to the clinic? Um, I've been like really weak every single time I try to like grab something. I can do it at the beginning, but so let's give up at like the ending. And same with my legs, I've been struggling to like walk, go up the stairs, sit down, get up from chairs. 
And it's been hard for like to do things with strain. That's very interesting. And for how long have you had these symptoms? Mm, probably for like three months. Three months. And that's, that's something that make it better? Or does, for example, if you exercise, do you think that the, that weakness get worse or, or improve? It gets worse. It worse. Yeah. And anything that make it better, like a rest? Yeah, when I rest, like I lay down for a while, then like my muscles start to gain strength again. And then when I start to do something, it just runs out, runs out again. Okay. And besides the symptoms, have you noticed any change in your voice? Mm, yeah, sometimes when I get like nervous, my voice starts to sound like if I'm sick or like I have something on my throat. Same with swallowing. Swallowing? Yeah. Even like food or just uh, water, for example? Uh, with food, I swallow, I swallow it. And with water, it just, I feel like it goes upwards instead of like just my throat. Okay. Um, have you noticed any change in your vision? Mm, yes, I start seeing like double or like blurry sometimes. Blurry, double, double vision. Yeah, like if I'm tired. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing your case with us. All right. So here we have um, <clears throat> this patient. Here we saw her video. Um, she's having this progressive you know, onset weakness. Um, and she has this muscle fatigue after she's performing, it sounds like just like activities of daily living, just, you know, walking around, you know, maybe it's like picking things up, walking up the stairs. Um, after she uses her muscles for a period of time, um, doing any type of activity, they progressively get worse. Um, and then she has to stop. So um, I want you all to Pretend that you are the doctor, you're the PA, you're the nurse practitioner, you're, um, you know, even the nurse, and this is your piece, your patient, and you're seeing them at your clinic or in your in the emergency department or at your place of work. And so we listen to her symptoms, um, and um, I want to kind of put up our first poll here, Jenny. So just based kind of like on those symptoms. What do you think could be going on with this patient here? Yes. <laughs> we are in about Almost all of our participants have answered. There's um, still some time left. I want to give everybody the chance to answer, kind of just to think about maybe what, where you're going with this or how do you, what do you think could be going on with the patient? There's a lot of different diagnoses, maybe different theories about what could be happening with her. And it looks like almost everybody has answered. Just going to give it a few more seconds. If you haven't answered, go ahead and do that now. All right. So I'm going to end our poll. I'll share our results. And you can see most everybody thinks it's this my my study of um, All right, so let me kind of pull out her vital signs. So sorry about that. Hmm. Why it's doing that? You all seeing my screen okay? Jenny, can you see yes. the okay, perfect. All right. So let's take a look at 
this patient, let's look at her vital signs. So we saw her video, we kind of saw what was going on to her with her, her symptoms she was describing. We know she's a female, she's 15, and we get her height and her weight. And these are, by the way, her real um, demographics here, that these are her real vital signs and her real signs and symptoms. We can see her heart rate is 76, her pulse oximetry is um, 99%, blood pressure is 107 over 59, her temperature is normal. They didn't do her respiratory rate, but really seems like these are all very normal vital signs. Um, and she appears to be a very healthy 15-year-old um, girl. She really has no past medical history. Um, denies any past family or social history. She's not currently taking any medication. So this is very interesting. So like what could be going on with her? So let's take a look here at the differential diagnosis. So of course, in that pool, you saw the myasthenia gravis. Um, we saw multiple sclerosis, thyroid disease, botulism, and this uh, polymyositosis, I didn't have satitis, satitis, I apologize, I didn't have that, I don't think I have that one in the pool, but that is another diagnosis that this patient could, could possibly have, um, but we don't know yet, so um, <clears throat> I'm just going to pull up my PowerPoint. And Jenny, could you just confirm for me that you are seeing my PowerPoint here? No, I still see the um, video. Okay. Let me. What about now? Yeah, PowerPoint. Okay, perfect. Thank you for confirming. Okay, so um, we're gonna kind of just go through here. So the dis the differential diagnosis. If you're not sure what any of these are, um, they are kind of complicated. Not um, all um, very common, but myasthenia gravis is a neurological disorder that's characterized by a decrease in acetylcholine receptors. Um, and patients can exhibit skeletal muscle weakness and fatigability, which this patient has definitely. Um, this polymyositis is, oh, let me go back. Sorry about that. I hate it when that happens. Hmm. Okay. Um, these are autoimmune diseases that cause inflammation of the muscles, most commonly the upper arms and thighs resulting in weakness. So that's, this is a very plausible diagnosis for her as well. Um, it seems like this, um, this, um, disorder can affect mainly the muscles. Um, of course, MS is a central nervous system autoimmune condition that damage the myelin um, in the muscle. So it causes symptoms like muscle weakness and vision changes. And then we have thyroid disease. And this is just a general term for a medical condition that keeps your thyroid from making the right amount of hormone. So thyroid disease, you could be producing too much of the hormone and maybe too little of the hormone. So, and then botulism is something that's very, very, very uncommon. It's rare, but serious illness that caused by a toxin that attacks the body's nerves. And that can make uh, breathing difficult. It can cause muscle paralysis and even death. All right, so I wanna kind of like put it all together here. So let me go back. to our patients. All right, so we're back to our patient here. We can see, there she is, there's our patient. And Jenny, please confirm that we are seeing my, our patient here, correct? Correct. Awesome, okay. 
So we saw what our differential diagnosis could be. Um, and I think the majority of you picked um, either MS or myasthenia gravis, and they do have very um, common symptoms. Um, we looked at her differential diagnosis here. Um, and so now we're starting to kind of formulate some kind of idea of these potential causes. So what kind of workup do you want to do? So now, you know, this is our patient and we have these symptoms and we're formulating this plan. Like, what could this be? So knowing that some of the different diagnoses could be this, how are we going to narrow it down? So like, what kind of workup do you guys want to do for this patient? So if you're the nurse, if you're the nurse practitioner, you're the PA, you're the doctor, um, what kind of tests are we going to order? Like, what are, what are we going to do to get to the bottom of this? So if you guys want to, um, I know that we have our chat on, if you just want to kind of just shout it out into the chat and um, that would be great as well. And I kind of take a look at it. Hormone panel. Yes. Um, what else do you want? To, what kind of, what else do you guys want to do? MRI possibly. Um, we can talk a little bit about what imaging would roll and roll out in this case. Um, what else can we do to get to the bottom of this? Um, we have to give her some type of diagnosis, hopefully, so we can treat her and make her feel better. Um, complete blood counts. Yes. And I see that's Jean. Hi, Jean. I'm glad you were able to make it to one of our webinars. It's good to see you here. Um, what else do we have? Acetylcholine receptor antibody test. That's very interesting. Nerve conduction study. Um, what else? What else are we going to do to roll in or roll out what we have going on with these symptoms? Electrolyte panel. Yes. I like where you guys are going with this. You're all thinking um, you're where you're going with it. You're all going in the right direction. This all makes a whole lot of sense. Um, these are all tests that we would order for sure. Um, so let's take a look at it and see exactly what we did for her. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll see. He should work out. Okay. Lumbar puncture, perhaps. All right, so what did we do? So this is what actually the these um, providers did for this patient. So they took a full medical history and that's always super important with any patients and when we're trying to um, figure out what could be going on with them and especially if in a situation where it's not so black and white, um, you know, it, it could be any one of these different differential diagnoses. So of course, medical history is super important. A physical exam. So you never want to... Um, discount the physical exam because that's going to give you a lot of really great information. Um, and a physical exam could be a number of different things. And it's usually targeted to um, what could be going on with the patient. So if they came in with shortness of breath, of course, we're going to listen to their lungs. We're going to listen to their heart. So a medical, a physical exam is going to give you a lot of really great information. So specifically with this patient, I'm just going to show you the physical exam that this provider targeted for this patient. I'll just play this video. And Jenny, just please let me know. I believe the sound is on, but I just want to make sure that you can hear it. And if not, let me know. So this is part of the physical exam. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna ask the patient just to do an exercise like as she is lifting weight with her arms. Can, yes, can you please do that movement? Just keep going, keep, keep going. And just let me know if you feel any, any discomfort or any pain or any weakness. What do you feel? I feel like I'm starting to like slow down. It's slow down, mm -hmm. like a week, no? Okay. What about in your eyes? Can you please open and close your eyes? Open and close, open and close, open and close. Do you feel any sensation, weird sensation, like a Did weakness? I'm trying to close by itself because I can't open it as big anymore. Okay. Okay, thank you for sharing your case with us again, okay? Okay, so that was the physical exam. You can see she has, she gets that fatigue 
um, as she is um, progressive muscle weakness. Um, it looks like they did do labs and we'll, we're gonna talk about this. We're gonna look at this um, on a PowerPoint, but CDC is the complete blood count, CMP, would include those electrolytes who one of this um, participants did add that in the workup. Um, and I also heard the complete blood count. I heard thyroid panel, of course. Um, we'll talk about a CK and aldolase delays and the LDH. And then of course, the myasthenia gravis panel. We also did a CT of the chest. So that's, um, I heard someone shout out in the chat, an MRI. So an MRI is gonna give you, you know, better um, imaging than a CT of the chest would. But um, nonetheless, they usually start with the CT first. So I'm gonna just pull up my PowerPoint here. Uh, let's go back. Sorry about that. <clears throat> While you're pulling that up, Leah, we do have a question in the chat that asks, why would you start with the CT scan over MRI? Um, an MRI takes a long time. An, an MRI usually takes um, at least an hour. It could be up to an hour. So in the ED, usually they start with a CT scan first because it's going to give you imaging um, in a much shorter period of time. So if there's anything on that CT scan that isn't going, that's suspicious, that they might want a little bit more information on or a, like more or better pictures or more detailed pictures, then they're gonna go for the MRI. All right, so here, so the labs, as I said, we were gonna kind of discuss that here. Um, as you know, the CDC is the complete blood count that will show the red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, hemoglobin, and hematocrit. The CMP is the comprehensive metabolic panel that's gonna show the glucose, calcium, sodium, potassium, bicarbonate, um, liver enzymes, bilirubin, creatinine, and BUN. And this is um, two lab values that are indicative of a kidney function. We did thyroid panel. I know one of um, our participants did shout that out. So this will use um, a blood sample to evaluate the functioning of the thyroid gland. Um, <clears throat> CK is um, the creatinine kidney. And that measures the amount of CK, which is an enzyme found in the brain, heart, and skeletal muscles, and in your blood. And when these um, organs are damaged, they release this CK into the bloodstream, and it's um, elevate the elevated levels that um, shown in the blood test could indicate some type of damage, whether it's like you know muscle damage or damage from the heart. Um, or um, it, it damage from the brain. So you'll see that a lot when trying to diagnose, um, especially uh, initially. Um, we have um, the aldolase, which measures the amount of aldolase in your blood to diagnose or monitor muscle or liver damage. Uh, the LDH is what we call the lactic acid. That's just really what we use. We call that as lactic acid. And it's an enzyme, um, which is a protein that speeds up certain chemical reactions in your body. Um, the lactic acid helps your cells make energy and it is found in almost all tissues in your body. And the largest amount of lactic acid are found in your muscles, liver, kidneys, and red blood cells. And then of course, the myasthenia gravis, gravis panel, um, and I think you guys kind of know where we're going with this at this point, but myasthenia gravis is a neurological disorder that's characterized by a decrease in acetylcholine receptors. So our participant who did shout out in the chat um, that we are going to test acetylcholine receptors, yes, you are correct about that. Um, patients exhibit uh, the skeletal muscle weakness and fatigue that we see with our patient and approximately 80% of patients with myasthenia gravis um, have detectable acetylcholine receptors, uh, receptor antibodies. So um, great job with that. You guys um, really uh, kind of, I think you hit most of all of these. So uh, let's go back to our patient now. We're gonna kind of start, we're putting all the pieces together here.
Great. So we're back to our patient. Can we all see her here? Yes. Okay. Awesome. All right. So again, we did her medical history, the physical exam. We looked at all of the labs. She had the chest CT and these were her actual results here. So you can see that she has this acetylcholine receptor antibody. She looks like she's positive here for that. You can see the reference range that's right here. Um, and so these, the reference range is right here. So negative, um, equivocal, and then positive. And equivocal, if you're not familiar with that, that means that it's just ambiguous um, or questionable. So if a lab result would fall within this equivocal that a lot of times then they um, most providers wanna repeat it. Maybe there was an error in the lab or maybe this there was something wrong with the sample, you don't know. So it's questionable, so we just wanna repeat it. But it looks like hers is positive for sure. <clears throat> All right, so we're gonna look at her diagnosis. So of course here, we know she's diagnosed with this myasthenia gravis. I don't think that's really any surprise. You guys were a lot, were right on it um, from the beginning, I think. Um, and um, uh, you did really, really well at that. So thank you for that. So let's talk a little bit about what myasthenia gravis is. It's a little, Bit of a complicated um, disorder. And um, <clears throat> I don't think there's a whole lot, um, there's a lot of information about it. Um, uh, so we are looking at my PowerPoint. I just want to confirm that. No. Still, still, seeing not, still seeing our patient. Okay. Now, are we seeing the PowerPoint? Yes. Perfect. All right. So we can see this um, myasthenia gravis is this autoimmune condition that causes the skeletal muscle weakness. Our patient has that. Um, and there are the muscles that um, connect your bones and help you move. Myasthenia gravis usually targets the muscles in your eyes, your face, your neck, your arms, and your legs but it can't affect your ability to move your eyes or blink, keep your eyes open, make facial expressions, chew or swallow and talk. And we can see that in the physical exam that our the patient did have that muscle weakness, um, but it sounded like at the end of her, um, at the end of the exam as well, that she was saying that she sometimes has trouble swallowing and it, this is definitely one of those symptoms and she was having trouble talking, which they call dysarthria. Um, and um, she also had that symptom as well. Um, so muscle weakness does, definitely gets worse after physical activity and, and improves after rest. And the symptoms usually happen quickly and it just is right on par with our patient. And so we can see that myasthenia gravis is a chronic neuromuscular condition. It affects the junction between your nerves and your muscles. And there is not a cure, but effective, tr effective treatment can help you manage your symptoms and function well. Um, again, just going over these symptoms of myasthenia gravis, um, the fatigue, the droopy eyelids, the blurry or double vision, limited facial expressions, trouble walking, um, we went over most of those, um, but what causes myasthenia gravis? Um, so what, is, what do you guys think um, in the chat? Um, what do you guys think if we could open up the chat? I don't know, Jenny, can you display the chat? It's um, accessible to um, everyone on the call. Let's see if I can. There we go. All right, perfect. Genetics. 
an inherited condition, maybe genetics. Um, what else do you think? What else could cause myasthenia gravis? Stroke, possible. Certainly some of these symptoms that people have with myasthenia gravis mimic what stroke symptoms are, you know, difficulty swallowing, difficulty talking, um, you know, weakness. Those are all same symptoms as a stroke. Combination of genetic and environmental conditions. That makes a lot of sense too. It could be hereditary, possibly side effect of bacterial and viral infection. Yes. Mutations. Yes. Yeah. You guys are all very smart here today. Yes. Yeah. So all of these things can, <clears throat> can cause myasthenia gravis. Um, I don't think I wanted to go. Oops, sorry about that. So yeah. We're not sure, but you know, the thing is they, like you said, these, um, it could be congenital antibodies pass from a birthing parent to a fetus during pregnancy causes neonatal myasthenia. And that is so rare. I, I don't, I don't even know that I've even, I've never seen that happen. I've never heard of it happening. Um, but apparently it does because it's, this is all from the Cleveland clinic. So, um, this information, so I'm, it's been documented that it's happened. Um, but um, it's mostly caused what I have seen in, in general, how I have seen it is that somebody has had some type of virus, uh, some type of virus. Um, they've had a surgery or they have been exposed to some type of bacteria and that causes, um, your body's immune system then mistakenly starts to attack itself instead of what it's being threatened with. Um, I know when COVID was, uh, COVID is still prevalent and around and we're getting it and people are getting sick with it, but it's not, you know, nearly as bad or as uh, virulent as it was in 2020 during the um, uh, pandemic. But uh, people that were getting COVID then would develop some people this myasthenia gravis. Um, every year we see people in the emergency room who have had the flu. Um, and then, you know, the next thing they're in the hospital with myasthenia gravis symptoms. You know, we always ask, have you had any recent viruses? Have you been exposed to any recent viruses? Um, so yeah, a lot, all of those things can cause myasthenia gravis. And I, so bacteria and exposure to viruses is what I see um, as a um, clinician mostly. So how is myasthenia gravis diagnosed? Um, so we diagnose um, by blood antibody tests, about 85% of these people have usually high levels of acetylcholine receptors, which we did see. Um, they also, we can do imaging scans and MRI or a CT scan and can check for the thymus gland problems like tumors. And really, um, the researchers, doctors are still very, I guess, unclear about exactly the role that the thymus gland plays in patients that are diagnosed with myasthenia gravis, but there is, um, research that suggests that um, problems in the thymus gland could cause that. So that's why they do the CT scan of the chest. And we can see that our patient did have that CT scan. And an EMG measures the electrical activity of the muscles and nerves. Um, and one of our participants did shout that out as well um, when we were asking about, like, you know, how would, you know, what would we do? Um, so doing uh, an EMG test would definitely, definitely be helpful for that. Um, so this is going to bring me to our second poll. Um, what, how do we treat myasthenia gravis? How are we going to treat this patient? How would you treat, how we're going to treat our patient? How are we going to get her well and get her feeling better? Give you guys all a chance to answer.
I'll give it about 15 more seconds. Looks like medication is winning the race here. Almost everybody has answered. All right, so I'm gonna end our poll. And these are our results. So the majority of our participants, 63%, believe that medication is the correct um, treatment for this patient. And as you can see, there's really, as we said before, there's no cure for it, but effective, a treat, effective treatment is available to help manage the symptoms. Um, so we are giving medications. So the majority of you did say that, yes, medications for sure can reduce symptoms, monoclonal antibodies. And most of this is done through IV. Um, and these proteins suppress an overactive immune system, um, plasma exchange or plasma for rhesus. Um, so an IV is connected to a machine and it re removes the harmful antibodies from your blood plasma and replaces them with donor proteins donor plasma or a plasma solution. IV, IG, um, you'll receive, uh, the patient will receive IV infusions of donor antibodies over two to five days, um, and it can treat the myasthenia crisis as well as generalized myasthenia gravis. And then surgery as well. I, in our pool, not many people picked surgery. I mean, we wouldn't immediately think that, and I didn't either, but Again, removal of that thymus gland um, is somehow supposed to help ease this, um, the symptoms of myasthenia gravis. So um, this is how we treat it. I'm going to go back to our patient because I want to see exactly, I want you all to see exactly what this uh, provider did for our patient. All right. Are we seeing the, we're seeing our patient? Yes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. So before I show you what they did for our patient, I do want to show you that the suggested treatment for um, myasthenia gravis would be immunosuppressants, uh, corticosteroids, um, is a cholinesterase inhibitors, and those are medications um, and immunosuppressions. Those are just big names. These two, this cholinesterase inhibitor and this codicor steroid is just um, big names for medications. But <clears throat> this patient was actually given um, mestadon, and this is a medication. So We'll talk a little bit about that and then on a slide, I just wanna kind of highlight that. But this is a oral medication and um, they were also, you'll, she'll definitely get a consult with neurology and then to follow up in a week. So it doesn't sound like our patient was really in a myasthenia gravis crisis. Had she waited much longer, uh, she probably could have been or would have been. Um, and I think what's interesting as well is that there's no really, there's no real clear reason why she got myasthenia gravis or how she got it. Um, you know, she endorsed that she had no past medical history, um, that she had no, no, no recent illnesses, no recent surgery. So um, we really don't know what caused it. But let's look at this mestadon. Um, that is the medication she was given to help treat her um, episode with myasthenia gravis. So again, this um, the medications, and we just talked about that prior to um, when we were looking at our patient was this cholinesterase inhibitors. They boost the signals 
between nerves and muscles to improve muscle strength and then the immunosuppressants um, like a steroid or a corticosteroid will help to decrease inflammation and then reduce the body's production of abnormal antibodies. And then specifically this mestinon um, drug, this comes as an oral tablet, it can come in an extended release oral tablet or oral solution. And then the dosage is variable depending on the severity of the condition. But um, the methanon is uh, uh, belongs to a drug class of those cholinesterase inhibitors. So we see that um, she did actually receive the medication. She didn't have surgery. She didn't need it, apparently. Um, and um, she didn't need IVIG. Her symptoms were pretty mild. So this is not surprising. Um, and then we'll just go back to our patient one last time. that we can see she took the mustard on, she followed up with neurology, and I'm assuming that she made a very um, quick recovery. So that is that is my Sinead Gravis. I um, will now open up our question and answer session, and I will stop sharing my screen. All right, so I'm just going to kind of pull some of these out of the chat here. Something, um, okay, is myasthenia gravis more prevalent in adolescents or does it affect all age groups? That's a really good question. Um, so it seems like it can affect um, um at a, people over the age of 40 more so than um, adolescents. And would it be the case to use MAB versus, I'm not sure what that, MAB versus medications. IVIG maybe, is that what you're trying to say? Um, I don't know, but perhaps, but you know, they based the treatment on the severity of the symptoms and had her symptoms been worse, she might've received IVIG if she was in a crisis, but medications is the go-to and it's cheaper than IVIG is very expensive. Um, also, a lot of times IVIG is on, it's, it's just hard to get. Thanks Elizabeth for, <laughs> for my glasses, you like my glasses. Thank you so much. I got them on Amazon. Um, what would treatment look like if the condition of the patient worsened? Well, the treatment would be more, um, I don't want to say more severe, but she perhaps might have needed surgery to remove her thymus. Maybe the IVIG is what I've seen clinically most uh, given mostly. Um, and then plasmapheresis is the other treatment that I see most often in patients that have um that are, are in severe crisis. And I've actually had patients that have had my, my spinae gravis. Um, it can get really scary. It gets to the point where they they cannot walk, they they are they are paralyzed. Um, and where it can get very dangerous is if the paralysis starts to move up their body and it gets to their diaphragm, it can actually paralyze their diaphragm and inhibit um, and have them not be able to breathe on their own, in which case they would need to be intubated. Um, but, um, you know, we don't ever want it to get to that point. So these patients are treated very quickly. And it, like I said, mostly it's with IVIG, it's with steroids, it's with plasma phoresis. Um, they kind of just throw it all at them um, to get them better quicker. So do medications continue to be effective use for long periods of time? Well, as you saw that there's really no cure for it, we're really kind of treating the symptoms. So we're trying to, you know, um, lessen the severity of it. So 
I suppose the medications may not be as effective over time. I guess that just depends on the patient. It depends on how their body metabolizes it um, and how, and, and really how worse their symptoms are. Might not be a pertinent question, but is there any relation between this and DOMS? I'm not sure what DOMS is. All right, so uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies versus medication. Is there a connection between monocytic gravis and other autoimmune disorders? So if you have um, other autoimmune disorders, you for some reason are more, um, have a higher chance of getting myasthenia gravis than somebody who doesn't suffer from autoimmune disorder. And that would just make sense, right? Because um, myasthenia gravis is a condition where your um, immune system starts attacking itself instead of the threat. And that is exactly what a, an autoimmune disorder does. So already your um, immune system is dysregulated. So um, people that already have an autoimmune disorder are more likely to get myasthenia gravis than somebody that does not. Delayed onset muscle soreness. Thank you for that, it, educating me on what DOMS is. Delayed onset muscle soreness. So might not be pertinent question, but is there any relation between this and DOMS? I have not, I don't see any relation between this and, and delayed onset muscle soreness. Um, and any of the research I've done for this presentation or any that I've done um, for any of my patients, I have never seen a relation or heard a correlation between the two. I'm not saying that there can't be or there isn't. I just personally have not seen that or seen it in my research. What type of specialist would be able to perform a thymectomy? A cardiothoracic surgeon, perhaps. Yes, a cardiothoracic surgeon. Um, yes, that would be true. I've seen general surgeons do this as well. Um, a thymectomy as well, general surgeon, a cardiothoracic surgeon. What physical th therapy be recommended for those more severe? Yes. So um, definitely physical therapy would be recommended for people um, with my senea gravis um, that are beginning to show uh, signs of recovery, then they definitely will need to participate in a physical therapy and, and an occupational therapy program. Um, to get their body moving again, get their muscles moving again, um, definitely for sure. Uh, thank you for your welcome for the clarification. I um, <clears throat> any more questions, comments, anything uh, I can. You have access to the Q and A um, box on your end. I do see a couple of questions in there. Okay. Yes, I see. Okay. Um, does it weaken the vocal cords? Yes, so it can weaken the muscles that control the vocal cords. It doesn't necessarily weaken the vocal cords, but the muscles that um, that control the vocal cords, yes. Uh, after getting the results from a blood test, is the high level of acetylcholine receptor antibodies alone what differentiates myasthenia gravis from, for example, another autoimmune condition? That's a really good question. And I would say yes. Um, Jenny would like to answer this question. Um, I am not too sure what the answer would be. Um, but that's something you can take back in research. Yeah. I have that, like it looked like in the chat that um it, like, I don't know if it, you like you had your hand up, but it looked like you wanted the answer. So that's why I picked on you, Jannie. <laughs> oh, no, I am definitely not the expert here. But <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, so could you explain what monoclonal antibodies are and what they are used for? So monoclonal antibodies, um, so they come from, so I don't know if you remember hearing about um, COVID and um, people that um, had COVID, severe COVID were receiving monoclonal antibodies um, for very severe cases. And what that is, is it is 
blood is taken from a healthy person that has already ex has already um, experienced the disorder, whether it's COVID or whether it's autoimmune or or it's myasthenia gravis, and so they've had the they've had the disorder, they've recovered, and so for some reason their body has created some antibodies um, that has fought off what this issue is and so or fought off the um uh the illness or the disorder and so those antibodies are very strong and it, clearly they're very healthy uh, because that person as well so now that blood is taken and it's washed and those antibodies then are given to a sick person with that same disorder here in this case myasthenia gravis um to help them to give them better a better um chance at fighting it off, if that makes sense. I hope I explained that okay. <laughs> How long does medication typically last to see results without surgery? I don't know. I'm not sure how long a medication, how long the medication would need to be taken before the patient would see um, a decrease in their symptoms. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think a pharmacist would be able to answer that question. I know that everybody's body is different. It also depends on, you know, your age and how you metabolize as well. Uh, let's see. How does myasthenia gravis related to chronic fatigue syndrome? How are they similar and different? So, with not knowing a whole lot about chronic fatigue, I'm assuming that means that a, a person is very tired all the time, probably has muscle weakness as well. Um, I I don't think that the two are really related, except that they perhaps probably have similar symptoms. And let's see, any other questions? I don't see any new questions in the chat or Q&A box. So as a reminder to everyone on the call, um, you will get an hour of shadowing experience um, from watching this presentation, which can be claimed via a certificate that will be emailed to you either by close of business tomorrow or Monday. If you do not receive a certificate, please reach out to the email I am dropping in the chat and we'll make sure to take care of that for you. And I um, want to thank you all so much for staying till the end. If you are still considering signing up for any of our certification programs, please use the code webinar 400 at checkout for $400 off. And I don't see any other questions here. So I guess we can close for today. And thank you all so much again for joining us, as well as Leah for the presentation. I learned a lot and I hope you all did as well. And if there are any questions we didn't get to, please feel free to email um, the email I posted in the chat as well. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks everybody for joining. See you next time. Bye. Bye.